You're done with your Oreo? <laughs> yeah, I'm done with my Oreo. Okay, good. Um, do we really know what happened? The brother did. The brother, that's what I thought too. I mean, that seems like kind of obvious. Hey, do you just want to talk about death? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just a murdery thing. Round two. Act two. Second go round. If you Second have times the been charm. following us on social media, you will know that. You put it on Twitter. Did you put it on the Instagram? Yes, okay. I did. You're a social media manager, so I rely on you, and you um, do a great job to I, do, in times like I'm these. I'm trying. I'm trying. In trying times Social like media these. has... I look at social media very differently now than I used to, and I don't like it as much as I used to. I, I think that's know. a lot of people. I'm just... Hmm, hmm. Yeah. Anyway, anywho, we were having some technical difficulties last <coughs> night. Um, Excuse us. We couldn't play back the it was just all. It was just gone. We're like, okay, like, yay, go team. Like, And then Mario <sighs> tried to like test it and play it back, and nothing happened. It was terrible. This has happened to us once before, and it sucks. So we're recording this on both our phones right now. hey oh. Yeah, that's because that's how techy we are. <laughs> Welcome to Mystery Murdery Thingy, by the way. My name is... Chloe. My name is Mario. I didn't pause that long. Dramatic pause, dramatic pause, dramatic pause. <laughs> and let's get Okay, right let's get to, to it. it. Let's get to it. I'll go first, like I did yesterday. Or you can go first. This is the, I don't care. Excuse me? What? We are pretending that this is the first time we've Oh, ever I'm so recorded. sorry. We're not supposed to talk about how this is the second time we're doing it the whole time? No. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'll go first. Just, like, it's the first time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my my mystery for this week is uh, is a thingy, and it's um, a mysterious radioactive cloud. Um, just super super weird. Um, so okay, so on October second of twenty seventeen, scientists at one of the so called Ring of Five detecting stations. <laughs> That were <laughs> so what? What the Ring of Five? The Ring it of seems Five seems very like Ring of Five. Yeah, I it, work for the Ring of Five, and they have a I ring. Know, right? It 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 seems very shady. They're they're trying to detect uh, nuclear uh, particles in the air, you know, in case something happens. And the, it was set up in like the mid eighties, so like it was in the time where you know, <laughs> bull shit was very much in you know people's consciousness still. Um, so, yeah, they, um, started out with five countries, but it's, like, 22 now, so it's, like, mostly in, in Europe. Um, and what the scientists in, in the labs in, like, Italy and Switzerland, I think were kind of the first ones that saw it, um, was a, a spike in the radioactive isotope, um, ruthenium-106. Ruthenium 106. Oh, she's my favorite Greek goddess. <laughs> Ruthenium. <laughs> she sounds so majestic. Ooh, look at her. Ruthenium. Um, and this was very unusual to get a, a spike in only Ruthenium 106. Um, and uh, because, you, you know, they, they had detected things in the past um, and not even like, you know, decades before this, you know, when a, an accident had happened or something at a nuclear facility. But to see ruthenium-106 by itself was very unusual. Is ruthenium an element in the periodic table? Yes, ruthenium is an element. It's a radioactive element in the isotope that it's in of 106, which, okay. which is called a nuclide. But um, um, other isotopes of it are not radioactive. Okay. I, I don't know why. It. Chemistry. I hated chemistry Aww. and the only reason i got through chemistry is because i had a good teacher I, I had good chemistry teachers too chemistry gives me nightmares and chills Aww. yeah it makes my back hurt <laughs> i was never that very good at it either i took the chemistry of art and artifacts in college in you know i didn't take chemistry you know, nothing it was pretty good um anyway chemistry nothing um, so the, um, yeah, the, they detected these, um, traces of ruthenium-106. Now, I should say that the, it was harmless when they were detecting it. It was like, it's such low concentrations that it didn't pose harm to anyone okay. or the environment. Okay. So it wasn't like this In big Europe. thundercloud, like raining cancer. No, no. Okay. You couldn't necessarily see the cloud. <laughs> And it extended over, like, the whole of Europe, essentially. Because it's so, a, in, like, a molecule. Right, because it's just these trace, trace elements. like, 
if you had to visualize it, right. it would be a cloud. Right. It's it's a cloud in, in sort of a loose way, you know? Yes. Um, it's a metaphor. So to speak. <laughs> But it's, yeah, it's these trace par- particles of ruthenium-106, but enough that, you know, it, it causes these spikes. But, yeah, it's it's like uh, uh, distilled over this huge area as well. So should we be scared? Um, no. But, but some people should, but we don't know where. <gasps> and that's the main kind of, like, mystery. So the early detections, like I said, from places like Switzerland and, and Italy and Romania were um, eventually confirmed by um, almost all the countries in Europe, except for the ones in Northern Europe. They were the only ones that didn't detect it. Mm. Russia, um, and there were even tiny trace amounts uh, found as far away as Mongolia, Kuwait, and Florida. In, like, tiny, tiny traces. Oh, my God. You know, because this stuff gets into the atmosphere, and it, it just, you know, goes and goes and goes right around the Earth. Um, I mean, in you know, in a massive, you know, like Chernobyl, right? Chernobyl, the particles went all around the Earth. You know, it surrounded the Earth. Um, just like with some of the bigger, you know, nuclear weapons tests, you know, back in the day, when they didn't even really understand or know what the implications of that would be, which is fucking nuts. Did we know the implications? No, no. I mean, no one really did when they well, first tested Einstein these things. didn't Einstein know it? He was like, guys, we shouldn't do this. <laughs> mm, That's what some people say. <laughs> I don't really know the whole history of that too much. I know some people that, you know, worked on the atom bomb for America and stuff did end up turning against it and, like, being big advocates on the other side, but I'm not sure Einstein's history per se, but anyway, um, the, yeah, so it, 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 but the highest levels were eventually detected in Romania, but this cloud swept across basically all of Europe from October, uh, until October 12th. So after that, they, they didn't really detect anything in Europe. So understandably, even though it was like basically not you know, an imminent threat, the radioactive cloud did generate some freak out, right? <laughs> Amongst, like, people and scientists and, like... What is this? <laughs> I'm sure you can understand, like, people seeing this, like, radioactive cloud in, in the newspapers, like, oh, shit, like, what's going on? Um, and their unease increased as time went by and no one admitted to having experienced, you know, any nuclear incident, right? Okay. That could have explained this mysterious cloud of ruthenium. Okay. And the first major investigative report that I heard about in my research was from a, a French organization, and it ind- indicated that the ruthenium-106, and, and kind of confirmed this, was very purely the only um, nuclide that was detected. And the absence of other radioactive elements immediately told them that this release had nothing to do with either nuclear weapons or a nuclear reactor. Okay, because that's good. Which, which which is obviously good, right? Because um, then, then those those are like the that big, means the someone's big... making weapons. Like if it was the or, other way around, yeah, um, or yeah, um, a big like meltdown, like Fukushima or something, you know. Um, so uh, th- this is because you know the the purity kind of tells them this because those kind of events. Um, produce a panoply of particles, right? But the cloud hanging over Europe in the early autumn of 2017 was very pure ruthenium-106. Super pure. (laughs) So, mysterious... uh, Mystery... (laughs) Mystery also surrounded the ultimate geographical source of this radioactive release, like I said. Um, The highest concentrations were over Romania, but it, the shape of the cloud, the fact that it covered the whole country of Romania, essentially, when it was first detected, precluded it originating in the country of Romania. So we, oh. we know that it, it's not from there. You said because the highest like concentrations That's were That's where the highest there? concentrations that were reported. Um, analyses at the time and since, and kind of, you know, weather patterns and where they were found in the different concentrations, have always kind of pointed to probably Russia. And this particular part of Russia... Um, that's near the border with Kazakhstan. I'm not surprised. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> For so many things. Like, was it Russia? Was it? I know. Mm, it's very zeitgeist How many of our mysteries is the answer is Russia? I know, right? <laughs> was it like episode two or something? Dominate with B- Ramsey, Boris Nimsov? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, the first denials from Russia came on October 9th of 2017, before the last of the detections had even occurred, um, from the regional authorities of Chelyabinsk and Sverd- Sverdlovsk, God, I've it so many times, who ruled out the possibility of a ruthenium-106 release from their area. 
certainly not from their area. So, um, this was, although, um, however, uh, kind of, you know, problematized when on November 21st of 2017, the Russian Federal Service for Hydrometeorology and Environmental Monitoring, (laughs) very official, (laughs) reported that it had detected heightened levels of ruthenium-106 in the southern Urals in late September 2017. Ah. Yes. Nevertheless, on December 8th of 2017, the federal Russian authorities reiterated that they did not believe the radioactive source was in Russia, and especially not, particularly not, specifically not, in the Mayak nuclear recycling facility. That's the one it could not ever have come from. They just, like, name dropped that? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's suspicious as hell. (laughs) By the way, it is not the recycling facility. Right. It's not so So, look away. (laughs) Yeah, it's called something else, like, officially, but that's what I think it is. But uh, anyway, they suggested, trying to be helpful, of course, (laughs) that the source of the ruthenium-106 may have been the release from the battery of a downed, burned-up satellite. Which would include radioactive ruthenium-106 in its uh, battery as a power source. But for several reasons, it's very, very, very unlikely that that um, would be the case. Um, But part of this is because um, detailed analysis, right, of the different concentrations show that whereas if it were coming from a satellite, you'd expect it to be like higher concentrations at a higher altitude, right? And then as it kind of filters down, getting less concentrated. Whereas that's exactly the opposite of what we see from this cloud of ruthenium-106. The concentrations are lower at higher altitudes. Oh, so that's how they know it's coming from the ground. Seems to be coming from a source closer to the ground, yeah. So, um, and despite extensive searching and checking with multiple space agencies, it could not be established that any satellite had actually gone down during that time. So, where's the satellite that supposedly caused this cloud of ruthenium-106? In January and April of 2018, there were two separate inquiries that were convened at Russia's request, um, and they included scientists from Germany, France, Sweden, the UK, and Russia itself. A science meeting. Right, a, a meeting of the science minds. One might say. Um, they get know, really drunk after. <laughs> this is the nerdy table. But you know that it, at, when you have like a group of scientists, there's there's like the nerdy table of the nerdy table, and then there's the cool table of the nerdy table, you know. It bifurcates. The, I'd be uh, at the nerdy one. The hydro... The hydro meteorologist. He's like, right. he's like top, top bitch. <laughs> <laughs> he's, the, he's the cool one. Um, and they were, of course, trying to determine what had caused this radioactive cloud and where it began. And they Mm -hmm. concluded by helpfully stating, well, not so helpfully stating, (laughs) that, uh, you know what's coming, that not enough data was available Mm -hmm. to make a solid hypothesis. I guess. So that was their um, conclusion, so to speak. Some of the experts and officials that were kind of quoted in my sources and that I, I read about their views seem to kind of throw up their hands at this point, right? Kind of essentially saying that they would have to wait for whichever country it was, you know, whichever one it might be to fess up to who had had some kind of nuclear incident that caused this. Cause Is that, that has to be what it was. And, um, others though, kept looking into it okay, and trying to come up with more particularly what may have happened. And they think they have a pretty good idea of what exactly did actually happen. And this mostly comes from a, a, a recent study, uh, a recently published study in the, the uh, uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences for the United States, um, edited by John Seinfeld, but it's like a bunch of authors, you know, it's always the way it is, like yeah, 50 authors. Which is weird. <laughs> and they all worked on it, so I guess they, they all deserve credit. Um they believe that they've ruled out most other possible causes. Um, And a couple of the other ones they've ruled out are the melting of a radioactive source, like a um, a certain dental and ophthalmic um, uh, equipment uses radioactive elements. What, like, wait, like dentures and shit? Well, I mean, think about it. You go to the dentist, right, and they take x-rays of your... Oh, and they use that... Yeah, they they always tell you... They have to create the x-rays. They always tell you to close your eyes because it's, like, super bright. It's radioactive, has to be radioactive elements in, involved, right? Um, 
when those are melted, they can cause a release of of of, of a radioactive leak, essentially uh, mm-hmm. an incident. Um, That's gonna happen. And this is, it's happened before. Um, it's happen again. <laughs> it could definitely happen again. Um, however, the two, 2017 incident, right, was too large, really, to be explained by by this. Um, that large scale of a melting of these devices, like, wouldn't go unnoticed. So okay. it really couldn't have. Been okay, that. I really didn't understand. Meant. I didn't really know what you meant. By yeah, it just doesn't explain the scale of yeah. you know the cloud that we see or saw. So, um, also the satellite reentry hypothesis was um, further kind of discredited by the fact that the uh, ruthenium one hundred six has a very short half life of only one and a half to two years. So, if a satellite had been in orbit for more than a ha- one and a half to two years, there wouldn't even be any ruthenium one hundred six left. Okay, and there wouldn't be enough to again explain this huge cloud of ruthenium 106 um and they think they have a pretty good idea of where it it did actually like particularly come from so they're fairly convinced that the release was from a mishap at the aforementioned (gasps) mayak industrial complex that we all know and love apparently they've had other issues if i recall correctly from my research um some incidents in the past oh, i think so this three is like, in the oh, past shit. maybe two or three why didn't they speak up yeah Are they embarrassed so, uh, uh, um <laughs> so it was <laughs> it was statistically likely for it to be them anyway well, right well, you know, is that how well, that works I, uh well maybe um probably so uh, yeah there there was um a um or rather, from from the pattern and everything, they suggest that between the evening of September 25th and noon on September 26th, the cloud of ruthenium-106 may have originated at the Mayak facility. That seemed to be where it was coming from, just from looking where the cloud was, where on different days, and how it moved, Shake and all head. that kind of stuff. And um, this could possibly have been that they were, you know, unintentionally, right, of course, produced this ruthenium-106, while they were creating this isotope cerium-144, which would be used for a neutrino experiment at the Gran Sasso National Laboratory in Italy, which, um, uh, just a, uh, just a, a little again? bit of background. I don't remember. Right. It's so, not like an energy drink no. or a diet plan? No. Okay. No, but it's funny you say that. Or it a ha- pill? It has <laughs> energy because it is a particle. It's not a pill. <laughs> and uh, it uh, it interacts very, very loosely with anything else. It's, it's a ghost particle, essentially. There's okay. billions and billions of them pouring through our bodies right now, and we have no idea. Well, because yeah, it we interacts do now. So All of us now know. Now you're aware, and you'll have a little tickle in your head every time you think about it um neutrinos all around we're bathed in neutrinos it's weird um it's a mystery actually um but (laughs) anyway to get back to what i'm talking about um if i can find my place so the the spent nuclear fuel which they would have been using right to isolate this cerium 144 um to use in the the that experiment in italy also contains ruthenium 106 and could have been released from the spent fuel while they were like waiting to refine it or whatever. Why were they making what were they making? They like were making molecule? the the cerium 144 radioactive isotope in order to create a, you know, a beam of particles to be used in the Grand Sasso experiment with neutrinos. That makes sense, right? I just Did that make sense? Was it's that weird sense? that people are like doing stuff on a molecular scale to me like that's wild oh yeah yeah um i mean i i definitely want to do another episode about you know particles and quantum like physics particles, and well yeah you know um i do i feel actually. like quantum physics mystery should be an extra yeah <laughs> Um, okay, so anyway, so the, uh, um, furthermore, the researchers at the Grand Sasso National Laboratory, when they, they talked to the press, um, said that they were notified that there was an issue at the Mayak facility when they were trying to produce the Cerium-144, and it was never delivered. The experiment never happened. Now, they don't know if, you know, that was what happened, that they released this ruthenium-106, and that's what went wrong but they know something went wrong oh so we still don't and even the know the core like problem like, no we really don't i mean that's really the with the, one of the cent- the two central mysteries here right what happened and where did it happen yeah we just know there was this cloud <laughs> we don't know what produced it 
Really? Oh, that's freaky. But they've been able to deduce that it's, it was something like this, where there was some kind of refining process or the, you know, the uh, recycling of spent fuel. That's probably where it came from and probably in Russia near the border with Kazakhstan. Probably. Probably. Allegedly. I'm not making any specific accusations. <laughs> Didn't I say that on a recent episode? <laughs> um, I feel like that's a good... Uh... So this is a very tidy story. And it's very plausible, but again, we don't know. <laughs> Another possible source um, that I read about in my research um, was the um, Research Institute of Atomic Reactors in Dimitrovgrad, Russia, about 90 miles north of the Mayak facility. Wow. Apparently, there are quite a few nuclear facilities in this part of Russia. I was like, I can't believe these places even exist. Yeah, there's, there's, there's several. But... Unless Russia suddenly changes their tune, tune. their tune, and uh, and uh, you know which hey, Putin has done that in the past, right? Oh no, we we didn't go we didn't uh, go into Crimea. Oh, and then a few weeks later, it's like yeah, we did. We went into Why? Crimea. He's done shit like that before. What? What is the psychology behind people like Vladimir Putin? Oh my god! Like what goes on is that's in his such head? a big <laughs> discussion. I, I, <laughs> that's a mystery. That is quite a mystery. So we'll probably never know for sure what actually did happen unless somebody again comes forward and, you know, lets us know um, the wider world. Um, but the last statement that was sent from Rosatom, the, Na- the Russian Nuclear Energy Corporation, to the Washington Post for their July 30th story, uh, recent story, oh. was, quote, We oh. maintain that there have been no reportable events at any Rosatom operated plants or facilities. Close quote. Okay. Nothing to see here. Um, so we'll give Rosatom the last uh, word on that one, <laughs> and uh, we'll see if there's any more to come in the future. So uh, my sources were Rick Nowak at Washington Post, uh, Jamie Ducharme at Time, Jeff Brumfield at KPBS and uh, the uh, National NPR, uh, Eric Mack at Forbes, Josh Davis at IFL Science, Alan Cowell at the New York Times, CBC Radio, Umer Irfan at Vox, Emily Conover at Science News, Peter Dockrell at Science Alert, and that study that I mentioned earlier, which uh, sort of pared down title of it is Airborne Concentrations of Radioactive Ruthenium 2017. Is that the one that got super specific, you said? Very, very specific. And I, d- I read the beginning of it. I read the abstract. I did not read the whole thing by any means. It is super long <laughs> um, and very technical. Um, but yeah, it's in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and it was edited by John Seinfeld from Caltech. Seinfeld true no relation i assume i wonder what people with the last name seinfeld have to deal with every day <laughs> right <laughs> so you're funny right like the Terrible. like jerry are you related and they all have to be like no why why would i be <laughs> wouldn't i have told you <laughs> a terrible terrible show about white people oh okay uh, moving on to wait, were you talking about friends Shut up. Well, I mean, that's true, though. I mean, you're not that off. I don't like Friends. It's fine. The other reason many people still have Netflix is because of Friends. But, but it's isn't it leaving? Yeah. I heard that. Yeah. People are not happy. Um, anyway, I have a history mystery for number 82 today. Um, <laughs> it's so uh, it is. The mystery of the miniature coffins. Ooh. Ah. Uh, yes. They yeah. Did. Yes, and Mario. Yes, and. Ooh. Um. So our story starts with the discovery of these coffins in Scotland on the northeast slopes of what's called Arthur's Seat. So. It's a volcanic hill that lies beyond Edinburgh's old town. So Edinburgh has an old town. I think it's and Edinburgh. A Is it Edinburgh? I think so. Shit. Edinburgh. <laughs> I thought I'd tell you this time. Sorry, we're not supposed to talk about it. Edinburgh. <laughs> I well, I don't so. want to say edit the wrong thing all the whole time. Well, we'll just address it just for a moment. We understand it may or may not be Edinburgh, but Chloe's going to say it Edinburgh. No, I'm going to say Edinburgh. Okay. <laughs> it sounds better. Pick a lane. So Edinburgh <laughs> okay, cool. had, old t- had an old town and a new town. And so the place itself, old town, is like 
It's pretty shrouded in mystery. It, um, uh, it's the possible site for uh, Camelot, uh, King Arthur's fable. Camelot. And it is said to be the home of the Votadini, which are a Celtic tribe from the Iron Age, so like 400 AD, um, in Great Britain. So there was an article from the London Times uh, that came out at the time that really described it best. It was written by a Charles Fort. When did it come out? In uh, 1836. Okay. It was written by a Charles Fort, who is a writer and a researcher who specialized in, quote, anomalous phenomena. Anomalous phenomena. It's fun to say. It just means I look at weird things. <laughs> <laughs> You've got something weird, come to me. I'm an oddities, man. I'm, in, I'm a researcher, an expert. Right. That's like how back then you could just be like a naturalist. You just like walked in nature and then suddenly you were like a scientist. <laughs> what? I don't know what a naturalist is. We're not going to talk about that. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So the London Times, July 20th, 1836, quote, that early in the morning in July, 1836, some boys were searching for rabbits burrows in the rocky formation near Edinburgh, known as Arthur's Seat. In the side of a cliff, they came upon some thin sheets of slate, which they pulled out. Little cave. Seventeen tiny coffins. Three or four inches long. In the coffins were miniature wooden figures. They were dressed differently in both style and material. There were two tiers of eight coffins each, and a third one begun with one coffin. The extraordinary datum, which has especially made mystery here, that the coffins had been deposited singly, in the little cave, and at intervals of many years. In the first tier, the coffins were quite decayed, and the wrappings had moldered away. In the second tier, the effects of age had not advanced so far, and the top, top coffin was quite recent-looking." So, yes. Uh, kind of creepy. Some boys who were running around near Arthur's seat uh, happened to come across these weird mystic coffins. And so there were 17, and of the 17, eight survived today. The Scotsman, a um, newspaper at the time as well, uh, they published one of the first accounts of the discovery, and they reported that, quote, a number were destroyed by the boys, pelting them at each other as unmeaning and contemptible trifles. And <laughs> Mario's like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> you goddamn kids. Um, so, yeah, there was a, lots of media about it. There was a good amount of buzz. Um, but after that, they were passed down by a series of private collectors. So Robert Frazier, a jeweler, a jeweler put them on display in his private museum. Oh, <laughs> I have a private museum. Well, bully for you. And he retired in 1845, and then they were auctioned off. But we don't know where they... There's no record of where they were auctioned off to. And um, they popped back up again in 1901 when with a set of eight. Um, together with their contents, were donated to the Na National Museum of Scotland. And that's where I got a lot of my um, information. The dolls are there. Um, yeah, you can see them. Uh, by their then owner, Christina Cooper of Dumfrieshire. In 1906, the Scotsman again published a story about the coffin. So this is kind of a weird story, but we'll take it. Take this as you okay, will. Yeah, because last time I didn't quite get the story. Okay, so I'll try to. I'll maybe try, try to, to like it. yeah, explain a little bit. So it was it was published by the Scotsman. They were like, oh, like we were reported. Here's like a report that was gave it was given okay. a possible explanation for what these these coffins. It's just are. hearsay. Yes, but it's kind of creepy. It's a good story, I think. So basically, there's this lady in Edinburgh, right? And uh, she's telling the story of her father, who they called Mr. B. And Mr. B would often be visited by, quote, a daft man, end quote, at his business. So daft means, like, foolish. Sure. Um, one day, the man comes in 
to uh, Mr. B's shop and shows him that he had drawn a piece of paper. And on that piece of paper, there was a, he had drawn a picture of three small coffins with the dates 1837, 1838, and 1840 written underneath. Turns out a relative of Mr. B's died in 1837, a cousin of, a cousin of his died in 1838, and his brother then died in 1840. Um, and after he he received that that little notation, the man never returned. Ooh. Never to be seen again. The Scotsman article you know, they tell the story and they wonder if this is, if this mysterious man was the maker of the coffins and that mm-hmm. maybe he was, quote, driven mad by the loss of his treasures, end quote. Or maybe it was just a coincidence, hearsay, a story. We don't know. It's a mystery. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so we kind of touched on this before, but it's difficult to say with complete certainty when the coffins were made. Um the the range that I kind of got was sometime between like the earliest would be seventeen ninety and the latest would be the eight like eighteen thirty. Mm-hmm. So um, note that the discovery yes. Yeah, so note that the discovery was made by a group of boys who probably mixed them up by hurling them at each other, um, and it wasn't some like trained archaeologist right who's like examining each particle. Um, so it's it's you have to, it's they're they're difficult to study because sure. of that there's a lot of factors right um several of the surviving coffins are also in more decay than others so uh some of the figurines uh the clothes that they're wearing the grave clothes are in a rotten state or they they're not there at all um but whether the decay was the product of time or simply weather is not now possible to say. So um, the more decayed coffins that were towards the bottom, so uh, it's possible that because they were lowered to the ground in in that nook, um, it's possible they were maybe exposed to water damage. So that's something they had to take in as well. Um, It wasn't until the 90s when... uh, these two guys, Professor Samuel Menefree and Dr. Alan Sip- Simpson, who Dr. Alan Simpson is the curator of the National Museum of Scotland. And they w- looked at the coffins um, and the little figures inside them with a lot more detail. So uh, the figures will, this is, this is what they discovered. The figures all appear to be made by the same hand, although it is possible that the coffins were created by two different people. Some of the material and tools used, uh, wood, iron embellishments, I think they use those for, like, the eyes, um, nails, uh, a sharp hooked knife, uh, these, these tools kind of indicate the coffins could have been made by a shoemaker, which kind of makes sense, because shoemakers would have had the manual skills to make coffins like this, but they would have lacked the, the sp- like the special carpentry tools um, needed to make something at this um, length precise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the figures seem to form a set, all eight of them, and uh, their upright bearing flat feet and swinging arms suggest that they may have been toy soldiers. Uh, their eyes are open, making it unlikely that they're originally designed as corpses. So then that's, if that's the truth, then that makes the coffins hmm. even spookier, right? Yeah. Um, and some of the figures are missing their arms, perhaps, perhaps removed so they could, they would fit into the coffins. The fabric that they're dressed in dates from the early 1830s. And then they do this whole analysis on like different tri- types of thread and how this one type of thicker thread wasn't made until 18 whatever and so mm. and it has that thread so that right. i don't know um, no stuff like that is great when it's yeah. like oh they didn't use this pigment this until, wasn't like, manufactured until blah 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 yeah they yeah. didn't start using screws until this year so it right. has to be from before then or something right um yeah so that's how they knew it dated from the early 1830s so that means they had lane buried there f- for more than six years. So then the next question is, who created them and why? Uh, why were they created and what do they represent? This um, 
this is one of those mysteries that reminds me of like Stonehenge because that's like all the questions you ask about freaking like Stonehenge mm-hmm. like who and and why the Nazca lines yeah <laughs> um what are they for yeah so at first a lot of people thought witchcraft right and this is also like prime time witchcraft for, yeah the Edinburgh Evening Post claimed that the coffins represented, quote, an ancient custom which prevailed in Saxony of burying in effigy departed friends who had died in a distant land, end quote. Another um, a newspaper, the Caledonian Mercury, added that, quote, we have also heard of another super- superstition which exists among some sailors in this country, that they enjoyed their wives and joined their wives on parting to give them a Christian burial in an effigy if they happened to be lost at sea. But if this is the case, then why are, like, they pretty similar? Like, it's obvious they're a set, and why are all the coffins similar? You'd think they would be... If many different people were making them for their individual husband, they would look different, different sizes and stuff. Um, and others looked at it as a burial to honor the fallen soldiers. There is a, another theory by an author and amateur historian by the name of Jeff Nisbet. He believes that he knows why they were created. So he believes that the coffins were created as a memorial to a political movement called the Radical War of 1820 and uh, those killed supporting it. So quick, quick background on the, the Radical War. Um, it's also known as the Scottish Insurrection of 1820. It was basically like a, um, uh, it was like a political movement, but it was pretty chaotic. Like there was a series of protests and, and lots of strikes. Um, so in Scotland during this time, only one out of every 250 people were eligible, eligible to vote. Right. So the right to vote wasn't, um, was a luxury of, of some sorts. Uh, artisans like handloom weavers, shoemakers, um, blacksmiths, goldsmiths, um, and woodworkers demanded reform and a more rep- representative government. So they were going on strike, pissed. Um, in 1812, the wages were cut in half and then a nine week strike followed. Furthermore, the Napoleonic, is that how you say it? Yeah, Napoleonic, Napoleonic Wars brought on economic depression so there was in general there was a lot of unrest during this time lots of protests for better wages and better working conditions um august of 1819 was when the peterloo massacre took place and um that's where a cavalry charged into a crowd of 60 to eighty thousand people uh who had gathered to demand the reform of parliamentary representation so Mm. they were just a crowd of protesters 18 people were killed and several hundreds were injured so that kind of kicked off and then that next year um 1820 was when there was all out war so yeah so that was when the strikes began and it turned to violence uh many poorly paid workers and weavers from the area were arrested and a lot of those who were arrested were exiled to australia and uh some several of the ringleaders uh were just executed so following the event uh many of those who agreed with the movement were putting what were put to work building a path that would become known as uh the radical road and the path is right around arthur's seat um Nisbet's theory Hmm. is that the reason for the existence of the artifacts was quote to keep the flames of rebellion lit end quote and to basically honor those who um, were protesters and and rebelled against their government for a better lifestyle and honor those who had um, uh, been killed. Uh, And then there's um, my favorite theory, and everybody's favorite (laughs) theory, is the Burke and Hare murders theory. Look at my eyebrows right now. You see that? Yes, they are vigorously moving up and down so these are also they're not like a straight up mystery but there are so a lot of questions in here like there's there are some question marks but here's that theory so i read a few places that mentioned the burke and hare coffin murder or the the burke and hare murders being related to the tiny coffins there was a couple of them and i was like 
who, what. So let's get into that. In the early 19th century, Edinburgh was really popular and known for medical excellence. So there were lots of medical schools and lots of students heading over there um, specifically to study anatomy. So with more and more students studying anatomy in Edinburgh uh, and then fewer criminals being hanged because that's where they got the uh, that's where the they got the cadavers uh, from the criminals who were uh, killed. The supply was no longer meeting the demand. So this is where body snatching comes along, right? Um, mm, a favorite pastime of 19th century low lives oh, yeah. in many, many different parts Everywhere. of the world. Yeah, Everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, um, really creepy. Like, yeah. Ew. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's a lot disturbing. of work. It is disturbing and like it completely immoral. Anyway. Uh, body snatching. So criminals started digging up bodies in churchyards, right, and selling them to uh, anatomists, anatomists, or anatomists? Anatomists. Anat- I was wrong both times. <laughs> anatomists for a cons- considerable amount of money. Uh, considerable amount of money. So in comes Irish immigrants William Burke and William Hare. So the murder spree started by quote-unquote accident. Um, one of the elderly tenants staying at Harris Porter House died suddenly, and, uh, the tenant owed, uh, hair money, so he goes to his friend Burke, and he's like, hey man, like, what should I do? This dude owes me money, and he's like, oh, like, you do sell the body? Like, hey, we could sell it, so, ooh, that's what they did. And Burke and Hare sold the uh, man's body to a doctor, Robert Knox, for use in his anatomy school in Surgeon Square. So um, <laughs> they were paid about seven pounds and ten shillings. And I don't know how much that is in American money, especially today's American money. Right. Lots of math. So I was just wondering, like, does does he just have a sign saying, like, will buy bodies, no questions asked, or something? Like, no, it's they like don't, a black market. They don't, like, look into where these bodies like, came I from. Heard, I heard Knox will help you out. Like, right, right. Yeah. A little fishy. <laughs> so, a little over two months later, when Hare was concerned that a feverish tenant would prevent others from staying in his boarding house, he and Burke murdered her and sold the body again to Knox. And that's when their murder spree escalated so and also most likely with the almost yes almost positively yes with the knowledge of their wives right oh okay um so they went on to kill 15 more people yeah and made 150 pounds which in today's today's american money kind of is around fourteen thousand dollars it was like a pretty solid right uh, Burke and Hare's actions were, you know, obviously caught up to them eventually. They were uncovered when one of the uh, tenants actually discovered uh, what wh- who would become their last vic- victim, uh, a woman by the name of Margaret Dougherty. And they, they found her body, and they were like, oh, what the fuck, and they called the police. So mm. uh, after examination, doctors concluded that she was likely suffocated, but it could not be proven. Um, So the two were arrested in November of 1828. However, Hare was granted... This is kind of bullshit, right? So Hare was granted immunity if he talked. So he... That's exactly what he did. He straight up confessed to all 17 murders and totally threw Burke under the bus. That's not a good deal. If you're a prosecutor, that's not a good deal. Absolutely. Come on. You're just going to let someone go for 17 murders? I mean, come on. Come on. Uh, formal charges then were made against Burke and his wife, Helen McDougall, uh, for three murders. They couldn't necessarily prove any more, but, um, Hare was like, oh yeah, we killed about 17 people. Like, that's fucked up. Anyway, so the case, and this is also kind of bullshit. Not, not that I'm saying like, oh, poor Burke, but you know. Um, the case against Helen McDougall, his wife, was found not proven, which in, and I learned this, which in Scotland was a, is a legal verdict where you are acquitted, but you're not necessarily innocent. Sure. Yeah. 
I think there's an American one too. Yeah, we, we, I don't remember what it's called, but there's something like that where it's like we have insufficient evidence to prove the case against you, but we're we're so we're just deciding not to proceed. It's like yeah, it's kind of motion not to proceed or something. Um, and then Burke was sentenced to be ex- executed. So January twenty eighth. 1829, William Burke was hanged in front of a crowd of thousands of people. Probably, they think, as many as uh, 25,000 people. They were like, That's crazy. let's get drunk and watch Burke get hanged. Like, that was a thing. Like, 19th century pastimes, watching people be publicly executed. 19... Now, there are still a few countries where that happens in oh. the world. There are still a few countries. That's Saudi Arabia. Dark. Countries like that. That's pretty dark. dark. That's pretty dark. Um, but this was a, a thing. Uh, tenants who lived alone, like above the square in the like apartments with a good view of the scaffold, sold their spaces so others could watch. It's wild. It's like selling your parking space when you live next to mm-hmm. Wrigley Field. Right. Yeah. Um, also quite dark. Um. February 1st, Burke's corpse was publicly dissected uh, by Professor Monroe in the Anatomy Theater of University's Old College. So it was a big fuck you, right? Right. Um, police... Okay, so this was a, actually turned out to be a, a big event because police had to be called when a large number of students gathered um, and they just... All they wanted to see was they wanted to see this dissection. And, but there was only a limited amount of space, only a limited amount of tickets. So a minor riot ensued. That's always fun, right? They solved the problem after one of the u- university professors negotiated and was like, okay, um, everybody, uh, uh, you guys can pass through in batches of 50, but only after the dissection has ended. So, like, just really the end the end result. Um, the procedure itself lasted two hours. It said that Monroe and mm, take this with a grain of salt. It said that Monroe dipped his quill pen into Burke's blood and wrote, quote, this is written with the blood of W.M. Burke, who was hanged in Edinburgh. This blood was taken from his head, end quote. <laughs> Your face. Great. Well, I was like, Wikipedia, where did you get this? And I, they had the source, um, a book called The Anatomy of Murders by Lisa Rosner. But they also noted that it was one of those books that, like, had the basic facts correct and the basic storyline, but it was also a little bit fluffed up. Mm. So, a kind of historical fiction, maybe? or Not enough, not enough bullshit to be called historical fiction. Okay. Um, Just kind of sensationalized history. Yes, that's the word. Thank you. So, great story, right? What does that have to do with our miniature coffins? Um, So, although it's difficult uh, to tell exactly when the dolls were made uh, and placed in the cove in Arthur's seat, um, but due to the style of clothing and wear, it's said that they were made no later than 1830. And so they have that timeline, right? There were 17 dolls, 17 victims. Uh, the dolls could have been placed there after the murder spree of Burke and Hare as a memorial. So I first read that and I was like, I guess. I didn't really get it. And then um, the two who studied the dolls, Professor Menefrey and Dr. Simpson, wrote, I think, a, re- a pretty good... A pr- it's a pretty good argument, I think. Mm, so, persuasive. Yeah. So, quote... That the problem with various theories is their concentration on motivation rather than on the event or events that caused the interments. The former will always be open to argument, but if the burials were event-driven by, say, the loss of a ship with 17 fatalities during the period in question, this speculation would at least be built on demonstrable fact. Stated another way, what we seek isn't is an Edinburgh-related event or events involving 17 deaths, which occurred close to 1830 and certainly before 1836. One obvious answer springs to mind, the Westport murders by William Burke and William Hare in 1827 and 1828. So when he, like, narrowed down the possibilities like that, I was like, okay. So if you, like, switch it to um, a motive, like, motivation versus... um, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, through no, that, the other way. Through that lens, it becomes yeah. like... Versus motivation yeah. to an event. Mm-hmm. Um, they also argue that because the victims were all dissected, maybe the coffins were the coffins were placed there so that they could have a proper burial. Um, and Simpson and Menefri published their findings in 1994, and they've have they've been looked at and elaborated on since. So the Edinburgh Evening News reported in 2005 that George that a, a George da, Dalglish. Uh, principal curator of Scottish history at the National Museum of Scotland believes, quote, the most credible theory is that we're made by someone who knew Burke and Hare, end quote. And so uh, if if it was someone close to them, it's it, perhaps they had a strong um, desire or, or m- motive to, to make amends for, mm-hmm. you know, the crime. Atone. Yes. Later, and then there's um, another weird thing that happened. I just thought it was worth mentioning. In December 2014, the National Museum of Scotland was delivered a mysterious package that contained a replica of the tiny coffins. It was sent with a label titled 18, question mark, um, but in like Roman numerals. And it also quoted the chilling climax of Robert Louis Stevenson's short story, The Body Snatcher, which was written in 1884. And that story weaves in elements of the Burke and Hare story. Mm. So it's like 18, like, oh, like the 18th coffin or here it is. And, may, and I was like, I don't really know what that means. But I, but what if it was like, oh, like, yeah, like my great, great grandfather made these coffins and like no one knows about it. And he like taught like my <laughs> grandfather and my father how to do it. I don't know. I really, I really elaborated it. Maybe. <laughs> That's pretty speculative. That's pretty. It's a stretch. It's a stretch. So yeah, that's what we got on our tiny, tiny coffins. Tiny coffins. Who um, knew? Sources are a Smithsonian Magazine article by Mike Dash, Bergen Hare Murders Wikipedia Murders Wikipedia page, Radical War of eighteen twenty Wikipedia page, and there was an article on the National Museum of Scotland webpage. They have a whole like interactive thing where they have facts about um, the exhibits and stuff and. Yeah, we should take a trip to the National Museum of Scotland. It looks pretty cool. I'd love to go to Edinburgh. Yeah, me too. I hope it's Edinburgh. I think Edinburgh. so. Edinburgh. Pretty sure. The town near where I grew up was Edinburgh. Edinburgh, Texas. 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 Right there on the border. <sighs> Texas. The Rio Grande Valley. So, um, speaking of Texas, my weird... Shit, shit in, in the, the news. news. Weird, Weird shit, shit in, in the, the news. news is not in Texas, but a Texas man. Uh, TSA officials find missile launcher in Texas man's luggage. Oh, nice. My uh, guy. Right. Story by Vanessa Romo from NPR. Um, so, yeah, he uh, apparently took a, a little jaunt to Kuwait on a little, his little holiday. And he thought, you know, hey, I some kind of memento, you know. To remember it by, uh, how about a missile launcher? <laughs> That's a great memento. I'll take that back from Kuwait and bring it through customs and the TSA. Oh, yeah, so, my God. um, yeah, the TSA was a, it said no, uh, even though it was perfectly safe, it was decommissioned, no one was actually in any harm's way or anything. They, he, he could not keep it or take it away from, and he should not have done that. Wow, um, so, wow, yeah, wow. that's not, uh, not allowed. Seems like a waste of everybody's time. True. True. So that's my weird shit. I did a lot of scrolling <laughs> and didn't uh, didn't find a lot. Nothing was perfect. That's fine. It's all we don't need kind to... of it's all very clickbaity. Like, oh yeah. Man arrested with a stolen vehicle to yeah, when he rode to jail or something crap right. like that. Um anyway. Thanks for listening. Thank y'all. you for s- listening. And, thank you so so much. For waiting on us. For caring about us, more and, or less. Uh, yeah, uh, f- follow our stuff because if, if our episodes Instagram, are delayed, we tell you. Um, Twitter, hit Mario us up on Text Patreon, get Patreon. some extra things, and that's what all the cool kids do. Um, so, yeah. Okay, bye. Bye.